I would guess that the vast majority of new watchmakers and even many more experienced home watchmakers really don't have a good understanding of what it takes to adjust or regulate a watch movement. Today I'm going to show you one of the two methods for not only equalizing horizontal positions, but the same technique can be used to bring the horizontal and vertical rates closer together before any adjusting or manipulating can be done. The watch must be in suitable condition to be regulated. If it's not, any attempt to adjust it will result in you chasing your tail trying to figure out why it's not working. So what is meant by suitable condition? Well, for one, there can't be any magnetism in the watch. This is the easiest thing of all to control, and if you're not already doing it, you should be demagnetizing the movement at least twice during your service work. Now, I'm not going to go into how magnetism can affect the movement negatively, since I've already done a video about it. So if you're interested in learning more, I'll leave a link down in the description. Next, the gear train should run completely free, and you should see a good amount of recoil or backspin when you spin the powertrain. Now, if it doesn't, that's an indication of either damaged teeth or pinion leaves, a bent pivot, a broken or dirty jewel, or problems with the end or side shake of the wheels. Next, the pallet jewels need to be properly adjusted, and there needs to be proper clearance between the pallet fork in both the dial up and dial down positions. Inspecting and adjusting the escapement is too involved to go over here, but if you're interested in learning about it, I did a two-part series available on Patreon going over how to inspect and adjust the escapement. Now, most of you should know by now that the hairspring needs to be centered on the collet, flat and parallel to the balance bridge, and the gap between the regulator pins or regulator key should be parallel and with a gap as small as possible without putting any pressure onto the hairspring. If you have adjustable regulator pins and they are bent in one direction or the other, that will affect rates both in the vertical and horizontal positions. You also want the movement to be in B. Anything over 1.0 milliseconds will affect the rate. So if you're working on a modern movement, you should be able to get the beat error to zero pretty easily. Vintage movements where you have to adjust the collet, I'm going to usually be satisfied with anything under 0.5 milliseconds. If it isn't already obvious, the movement needs to be clean and oiled correctly. The amplitude should be regular. And after running from a full wind for 24 hours, should not be much lower than 210 degrees for a manual wind watch, and no lower than about 190 degrees for a self-winding watch. And finally, for manual wind watches, which are fully wound, the watch should not have so much amplitude that it causes it to knock. Getting these nine conditions correct is really the report card of your inspection process and your overall knowledge, as well as your eye for detail. To demonstrate how to equalize horizontal positions, I have a movement with a known problem that's been serviced. At a full line, this movement has an amplitude around 280 degrees, so overall it's pretty healthy. I will run it on the time grapher in the laying positions for 30 seconds to settle in and then for about another 30 seconds to capture the amplitude and rate. When we compare dial up to dial down, you can see we have a rate difference of 8 seconds and a 28 degree amplitude difference, which is too much to be able to regulate the watch with any real accuracy. You can't even begin to start regulating a watch until the horizontal positions are almost equal. The reason that this is true is that the forces on the escapement in the dial up and dial down positions are exactly the same. So therefore, the amplitude and rate should be about the same as well. What changes dial rates are how far away the parts are from factory condition and good lubrication. In our particular case, when the movement is in the dial up position, we have a much lower amplitude. So when troubleshooting, we can assume that the problem is below the balance wheel, which is causing the additional friction. 
as well as lowering the amplitude. The most obvious place to start looking for the cause is at the balance jewel and the balance cock, which is below the balance wheel when the dial is facing up. Now, after removing and cleaning the end stone, we can clearly see a divot where the balance wheel has been running for an extended period of time with no lubrication, and now is basically drilling a hole in the cap jewel. Now, that's most likely the reason, if not clearly, what's causing the additional friction on this pivot. What I want to show you today seems to be one of the great mysteries of watch regulation, and I'm going to use this example to demonstrate what that looks like. In this example, it's the divot on the sandstone causing the additional friction, as well as a probable flattening out of the pivot. The tip of the balance pivot has a slight dome shape to it which is there to reduce friction as it spins back and forth on the end stone. The flatter the tip, the more friction. The more dome the tip, the less friction. What we're going to attempt to do here is lower the amplitude on the opposite jewel in the main plate, or the dial down position, by adding friction so that the amplitude and rates are as close to equal as possible. Now to do this, I'm going to start by removing the balance wheel so that I can clean off the lubrication from the balance pivot. Then I'm going to remove the end stone and clean off the lubrication from the cap jewel and reinstall it dry into the shock setting. Okay, now we have the top jewel lubricated, but with a divot on the end stone and a slightly flattened pivot tip. And on the lower jewel, we have a normal balance domed pivot, but now the end stone is unlubricated. The lack of lubrication is going to increase the friction on that pivot, lowering the amplitude when that pivot is under the balance wheel. Now watch what happens when we run this movement on the time grapher again, first in the dial down position. The dry jewel is under the balance wheel, and you can see the amplitude is 240 degrees and the rate is at plus eight seconds per day. Now, when we check the dial up position with the divot under the balance wheel, our amplitude settles out at 236 degrees with a rate of plus nine seconds per day. As you can clearly see, I've been able to equalize the horizontal positions by changing the friction on one of the balance pivots so that now we are within four degrees of amplitude and one second per day. This example also shows you why it's important to oil the balance pivots with the same amount on each stone. You can see how if one cap jewel is lubricated at say 25% of the surface of the end stone, and one is at 75% of the surface of the end stone, that can change the friction and amplitude from one position to the other. In the case of this movement, the upper jewel was probably over lubricated, which caused all the oil to run out of the jewel setting, leaving it dry, which caused the balance uh, pivot to carve out this divot. There are a handful of other reasons that horizontal positions can differ in amplitude other than the balance pivot tips that you need to be aware of, and they must be correct first before you can start manipulating amplitude at the pivots. Other than the nine points I made before, one of the balance pivots could have a slight bend in it. If it is, you're going to need to replace the balance staff because the chances of getting it perfectly straight are almost zero. The regulator pins are not parallel or perpendicular to the regulator, which causes differences. When the pins are not parallel, the hairspring rides differently in between the dial up and dial down position, effectively shortening the balance spring in one of those positions. Even a variation in the end shake between the escape wheel, the pallet fork, and the balance wheel can create an array of dial up and dial down differences. One of the more common issues is that the pallet forks guard pin is either dragging or hitting on some part of the main plate, or the guard pin itself is hitting the safety roller and causing friction and loss of amplitude. 
these clearances should be checked in your escapement inspection. Another cause of differences in horizontal positions is the end stone is not set and flat in the chateau. Uh, commonly because there's dried oil in the bed where the end stone sits, or the spring holding the end stone is damaged and it's not holding the end stone correctly. So all these issues need to be checked and corrected before the pivots can be manipulated. Now, in the example we just did, not oiling the jewel produced the result we wanted, but it didn't fix the problem. The best option would be to source and replace the entire shock jewel block, since you can't just buy the end stones. If you don't have a jeweling set, many times you can just drop in the new chateau and end stone, and that would solve the divot problem. But we also will have a flattened pivot. To alter the pivot tips, you can go in two directions. You can either flatten out tips or make them more dome shaped. To round the tip of the balance pivot, you have basically two options the Bergeron 5482 or the jacket lathe. The 5482 is basically a handheld polisher that you spin between your fingers that has a cone shaped jewel on the inside of it. To use it, you make a paste of diamantine powder and oil, insert a small amount inside the cone, then you spin it back and forth between your fingers to polish the tip. Since the jewel is cone-shaped, it is basically grinding the flat part of the tip, rounding and polishing. I can tell you that this works, but it is a long process. Diamantine powder is for polishing. Using anything with a stronger grit would be too aggressive for the pivot and could potentially damage the tool. Now, what I did with mine is I cut off the little ball on the tip of the polisher, and it fits perfectly into my rotary tool, which allows me to hold the balance wheel. And now instead of spinning it with my fingers, I can now speed up the process tremendously, polishing and reshaping the pivot tip. Just make sure that you clean the balance wheel very well, separately from your normal cleaners that you would clean watch parts with, so that no diamantine powder gets transferred into the jewels after assembly. My preferred method for adjusting pivots is using the jacket lathe and burnishing the pivot tips. With this tool, you can both round or flatten the pivot tips. The pivot polisher has a lantern runner to hold the balance pivot. The end of the runner has holes that the pivot is inserted into. Start by measuring the top of the pivot right before it turns into the collet shoulder. I find these Matoya digital calibers to be as accurate as you will ever need without breaking the bank. So if you're looking for a digital caliper, this is a very good one. Now, in our example, the top of the pivot is 275 thousandths of a millimeter. So on the lantern, I can use the whole size of 0.28 hundredths of a millimeter. Now you set up the lathe just like we did in my last video. So if you haven't seen it, I'll leave a link in the description. All right, burnishing pivots takes a light touch. Burnishing balance pivots takes a very, very light touch. It needs to be heavy enough to be able to stretch the metal, but not so hard that you're gonna bend the pivot. The main difference between burnishing a dome on a balance pivot and burnishing a regular pivot is that with a regular pivot, you're just holding the burnisher flat on the pivot as you work it. When you're working with balance pivots, you have to move the burnisher at an angle to shape the dome on the pivot. Okay, so first, if you wanna flatten a pivot to reduce the amplitude, you just hold the burnisher flat to the tip and you start slow until you get a feel for how much the burnisher is working. I would recommend that you take four or five swipes of the, of the burnisher across the bottom of the pivot tip, clean everything and then check your results. Compare the before and after amplitudes 
then do it again if you need. There's no formula on how long or how many times you need to run the burnisher across the tip. Your results will depend on how aggressive you have the burnisher dressed. And as you can imagine, it'll take longer to do a balance pivot from a size 18 pocket watch compared to a tiny balance on a small ladies movement. Now, just like any advanced techniques, you have to practice to get a feel for it. I probably wouldn't practice on Grandpa's Omega, so get yourself a cheap throwaway for about 10 bucks and use that for practice. Even though the short side of the burnisher is at a slight angle, the entire tip gets the same amount of contact because the pivot is actually spinning. Also notice that when I pull on the cord, my burnisher is traveling in the same direction. I mention this because this seems to visually confuse some people who expect the pull stroke and the burnisher stroke to be opposite of each other. I'm able to do this because of how I've wound the string around the barrel. What's important is that the wheel is spinning toward me as the burnisher is moving away from me. I do it this way because I feel it gives me more control than moving my hands in opposite directions, but you can set it up either way. Now, when doming a tip, I start the stroke with the burnisher straight across the bottom of the tip, and as I'm pushing the burnisher, I move it slightly so that I finish the stroke at this angle. And that's it. So how can you use this information to equalize horizontal and vertical positions? Well, let me give you just an example. Let's say you have a wristwatch movement whose balance wheel is poised as best as it can be. It's a low to medium grade movement, so we're only going to look at regulating three positions. Dial up, six o'clock up, or crown right on the time grapher and nine o'clock up or crown down on the time grapher. 12 o'clock or crown left on the time grapher is only used briefly when you're checking the time. And three o'clock up or crown up on the time grapher is only used if you sit with your arm pointing up a lot. All right, with the regulator centered, the dial-up position in our example has 280 degrees of amplitude and it's running at zero seconds per day. Crown right has an amplitude of 240 degrees of amplitude and plus 10 seconds per day. And crown down is at 240 degrees of amplitude and is running at plus 10 seconds per day. So at this point, if you move the regulator, it's going to slow down or speed up all the positions, right? So nothing really changes. To bring the dial rate closer to what the vertical rates have, which is plus 10 seconds a day, you would flatten both balance pivots just enough to increase the friction in the dial position until the rate raises to plus 10 seconds per day. Since this adjustment to the pivots does it affect the rates of the vertical positions? Everything there should still be the same. And now with three positions, all at plus 10 seconds a day, moving the regulator will affect all of the positions. So you can nudge the regulator toward the hairspring stud, slowing all the rates down as close to zero as you can get. Now, this is just an example to illustrate one way you can manipulate horizontal and vertical positions to bring the rates closer together. What's important here is learning this adjustment concept. And if you do, and actually put in the work to practice what I showed you today, it will make you a better watchmaker.